I was arguing that during the whole of the history of the negotiations, there has been a central problem, which is that our politicians have tended to take what I would call the low road of arguing about pound shillings and pence and about prices, which all of which matter, of course, but what they have done is they have tended to deny that it was about what it was about as well, which is closer political union. That, I argue, particularly in a country like Britain, which has a much longer history as a unified state and has no 20th century traumas to make it think it needs to take shelter, I think is exactly the wrong line to take. I think it would have been much better and much more honest if politicians had, when Tony Benn and Enoch Powell said this is about political union, not said no it's not, said yes it is and this is why and it's a good thing for those reasons. The failure to do that I think has got us to where we are now. I'm Simon Hicks, I'm Professor at the London School of Economics and what I was presenting today was research uh, results on looking at uh, whether the UK is marginalised in the EU institutions focusing on the Council and the European Parliament. So the evidence from the Council suggests that on the one hand the UK is on the losing side in votes in the Council more than any other member state, but UK officials in the working groups of the Council are at the heart of EU decision making. So for example when you ask other officials from other member states who they contact in the policy making process, they name British officials. In the European Parliament, British MEPs again are more likely now to be on the losing side than on the winning side and more often than most other member states. But that's largely to do with the fact that British MEPs no longer sit in the main political group. So that's largely British Conservatives who've left the EPP on the centre-right and a growing uh, number of British Eurosceptic MEPs, you from, from UKIP, sitting in a more radical right. So overall the picture I was presenting was, was a sort of mixed picture, but, but generally suggesting that over the last 10 years, the British government and British MEPs are more likely to be on the losing side than the winning side than they were 10 years ago. What I said this afternoon was that the UK has partial control of its borders. It, it can control the numbers of people coming from outside the EU more or less. It can't really control the numbers coming from the EU in any real way, but it can filter them out when they get to the border. We can see who has an EU passport and who doesn't and make decisions on whether we allow in the non-EU citizens. And in fact, we actually do that earlier. We have a process of whether people can get visas or not, and many people don't even apply or, or try to come here as immigrants because they don't meet the criteria. So we do have that degree of control. It's over half the people who come here are from outside the EU. So really it's a combination of significant degrees of control over non-EU migrants and, and no real control over EU migrants. I'm here to say to make the case that if we vote to leave the European Union, we will no longer have to send £350 million a week to Brussels. That's money that can be spent on our priorities and we will be better off because we will have control over the laws, we'll be able to vote out politicians who make the wrong decisions, we'll be safer, richer and more secure. The UK is the world's largest export of financial services. Being a member of the European Union gives the UK access to the largest single market in the world. While this has many opportunities, it also comes with a cost. There are some limitations on actions that the UK can take without the permission or support of other members of the European Union. And so we have a trade-off. And the critical question is whether those limitations would either endanger taxpayers' money or financial stability. That is at the heart of this question from the banking and financial services sector point of view. I'm coming along to this conference to explain why I think that the EU amplifies Britain's voice in the world and allows it to promote its interests and its values more easy than it could on its own. In particular, the EU is an important pillar of the West. The West means a group of countries that are committed to democracy, the rule of law, human rights, market economics. And these countries used to run the world, they don't anymore. There's plenty of emerging powers and new powers that don't share Western values. But the EU plus the US is trying to maintain these values. And if the EU is weakened, by a British departure or by other problems such as the Euro crisis or refugee crises, then the EU will be less pl well placed to push for democracy, human rights, rule of law in international relations. People forget that the EU has made, achieved quite a few things in foreign policy, traditional foreign policy in the last few years. Look at the deal between Serbia and Kosovo 
that Catherine Ashton brokered as the EU's high representative. Look at the Iran nuclear talks that the EU initiated more than 10 years ago, which finally concluded in persuading Iran to put a, a halt to its nuclear program with, with help from the Americans, the Russians and the Chinese. But the EU started those talks. Look at the transition to, to democracy in Burma. That was partly because the EU said to the generals in Burma, if you release Aung San Suu Kyi and let um, her party contest elections and release other political prisoners, we will engage with you and remove our sanctions. That worked. So I would say in many parts of the world the EU is helping Britain achieve its objectives of promoting human rights, democracy and a rules-based international system. What I wanted to try and show is that the UK's influence over the Commission has been, has been, has been mixed. Um, it's often presented as quite negative in the press and the, um, it's, it, you know, the, the Commission is often portrayed as the enemy um, of the UK. And what I wanted to demonstrate was that um, the picture is more complex than that. The first thing I wanted to show is that actually um, it is true that the UK presence um, in the Commission has declined. And um, in short, there are fewer officials than there should be, measured against the expectation one might, one might create. But that, that there's also um, a sort of deficit of representation at each level of seniority. Um, it's particularly serious with the senior managers. So even between the points I was looking at, 2008 and 2014, there's been a decline. Moreover, UK officials aren't in the right places. They're in translation, they're in interpretation, they're in communications. Now, those are really important service directorates general, really important departments, um, but they're not the commanding heights of um, regulation or even of redistribution. They're not the great funding departments. Um, so I'm thinking here about um, competition, of, D of DG Market, DG Regio, um, other really important and influential departments. Brits should be in those, um, in those departments, and, and, and they aren't. The more positive picture comes for it when you look at the sort of politics and policy of the Commission. And there I think um, the Commission really has taken on what you might describe as sort of British preferences. Um, it's become a lot more orderly as a house, for example. Um, that's been as a, as a consequence of um, quite deliberate presidentialisation under Barroso for 10 years from 2004, but also more recently under Juncker. Um, that means that whereas policy could just sort of leap out of any Directorate General at any moment, there's now much, a much more programmed approach. That's the first thing. The second is a more orderly approach to, um, to prioritising and program, programming um, policy. So there I'm thinking of deciding exactly what needs to be done, um, thinking it through in terms of sort of um, scheduling um, proposals, but also um, interacting with other institutions. That's been another improvement. The third thing has been an attempt to improve the quality of proposals. Um, and one way that's been done is to introduce um, a, a very robust, uh, actually expanding impact assessment procedure. A fourth item is um, just lessening the administrative burden. And there have been a number of exercises over the, the last 10, 15 years which have sought to, um, to scrutinise existing EU legislation um, with a view to, um, to making sure that the, that the burden on businesses and on governments have, have, been, have been reduced. The last thing is, um, is reducing the legislative the legislative burden and so there's been a very determined effort, effort which has been very successful on the part of Barroso initially and now of Juncker to reduce um, the EU's regulatory output and that can be seen in a graph which, which I haven't seen reproduced in for example the UK media um, which shows a, a decline and a particularly steep decline after 2010 in the number and volume of um, legislative proposals um, tabled by the Commission um, but also a similar um, you know, reflection in the output um, in the volume of um, EU legislation. Although um, there aren't as many UK nationals within the Commission as one might expect, there's a, you know, UK preferences have really been taken to heart um, by decision makers at the top of that organisation.